Mrs. Bennet reveals to Mr. Bennet that Netherfield Park has been leased at last to a single man in possession of a good fortune who must be in want of a wife. The Bennets have five daughters, and Mrs. Bennet is determined that Mr. Bingley will marry one of them. While their second eldest daughter, Elizabeth, is out walking with her dear friend Charlotte Lucas and a cousin by the name of Mr. Collins, who is set to inherit the family estate, Mrs. Bennet, Jane their eldest daughter, and Lydia their youngest daughter, are paid a visit by a Mr. Wickham. Lydia pays him far too much attention. Upon returning from their walk, Mr. Bennet reveals that Bingley and his friend Mr. Darcy will soon pay the Bennets a visit. Close to the start of their visit, Mr. Darcy remarks on the confined and unvarying society found in the country. But Mr. Bingley assures Mr. Darcy there are many fine estates about, and Mrs. Bennet takes the opportunity to show Bingley their view of the neighboring estate's chimneys, leaving Darcy and Elizabeth behind. Would not you also like to see the chimneys, Mr. Darcy? Thank you. Like yourself, I prefer people to places. Did I say that? Not precisely, but I have drawn that conclusion. Well, I can laugh at people better than places, and I dearly love a laugh. Isn't that a rather dangerous trait, Miss Bennet? The wisest and the best of men may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, but I hope I never ridicule what is wise or good. Whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. But these, I suppose, are precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for anyone. But it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule. And in your list of weaknesses, do you include such faults as vanity and pride, for instance? Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed. But pride? Where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will be always under good regulation. I am perfectly convinced, Mr. Darcy, that you have no defect. I have made no such pretension, Miss Bennet. I have faults enough. My temper I dare not vouch for. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others against myself. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. It is a failing indeed. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. But you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil. A natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is a propensity to hate everybody. And yours to willfully misunderstand them. One afternoon at the Bennetts, during another visit from Bingley and Mr. Darcy, Mr. Collins informs all that his patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, is a close relation to Mr. Darcy. Colonel Forster and Wickham are also visiting the Bennetts' home, and Wickham reveals his dislike for Mr. Darcy to Elizabeth. Mr. Collins asks for Elizabeth's hand in marriage and assumes she will accept him. She does not. Fortunately, soon after, Elizabeth comes to find out that Mr. Collins has since proposed to her dear friend Charlotte. Bingley graciously throws a ball at his estate, but Lydia is quite disappointed to find that Wickham will not be in attendance. Many assume this decision is due to Mr. Darcy. Do not you feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel? Do not you enjoy the reel, Miss Bennet? Oh, I heard you before but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing that kind of scheme. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. It is your turn now to say something, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some kind of remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. I assure you, I will say whatever you wish. Very well. That reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. Do you talk by rule, then? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. And yet... 
For the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged that they may have the trouble of saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you are gratifying mine? Both, for I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity with all the eclat of a proverb. This is no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure. How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I shall not decide on my own performance. I am surprised not to see Mr. Wickham here tonight. I find that he is a great favorite with the officers. He has made many friends among them. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. Have any two people had less to say for themselves? We have tried two or three subjects already without success, and what are we to talk of next? I cannot imagine. What think you of books? Books? Oh, no, I am sure we never read the same, or not with the same feelings. I am sorry you think so, but if that be the case, there can at least be no want of subject. We may compare our different opinions of them. No, I cannot talk of books at a ball. My head is always full of something else. The present always occupies you in such scenes, does it? Yes, always. I remember hearing you once say, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was unappeasable. You are very cautious, I suppose, as to its being created? I am. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice. I hope not. It is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion to be secure of judging properly at first. May I ask to what these questions lead? Merely to the illustration of your character. I'm trying to make it out. And what is your success? I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. I can readily believe that reports may vary greatly with respect to me. And I could wish, Miss Bennet, that you were not to sketch my character at the present moment. As there is reason to fear that the performance would reflect no credit on either. But if I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours. May I have the honor, Miss Elizabeth? Thank you, Mr. Darcy. I am indisposed. As it turns out, reports do vary greatly. Mr. Bingley's sister assures Elizabeth that any wrongdoing between Darcy and Wickham was the fault of the latter. Miss Bingley asks that Elizabeth believe her. She does not. It has become quite clear to anyone with eyes that Bingley has fallen in love with Elizabeth's older sister Jane. While Lydia complains that she wishes to follow Wickham and the regiment to Brighton, it is revealed to Elizabeth that Mr. Darcy has stopped Mr. Bingley from making such an imprudent match. Bingley will not propose to Jane. Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Elizabeth finally meet. The lady manages to insult Elizabeth and her family mercilessly before taking her leave. I am here again, Miss Bennet. I saw Mr. and Mrs. Collins drive away with my aunt. I have something which I must say to you. Miss Bennet, in vain have I struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to admire and love you. Miss Bennet, I, I can well understand your own astonishment at this declaration, for I am amazed at myself. My feeling for you has taken possession of me against my will, my reason, and almost against my character. Sir! Oh, understand me, I beg of you. For yourself alone, my admiration is only too natural. I share it with everyone who has the happiness of knowing you. But, pardon me, for it pains me to offend you. The defects of your nearest relations, the total lack of propriety so frequently portrayed by your family, has so opposed my judgment to my inclination, that it has required the utmost force of passion on my part to put them aside. 
But my dear Miss Bennet, your triumph is complete. Your own loveliness stands out the fairer in its contrast to your surroundings. And I now hope that the strength of my love may have its reward in your acceptance of my hand. Mr. Darcy, in such a case as this, it is, I believe, the established mode to express a sense of obligation for the sentiments avowed, however unequally they may be returned. If I could feel gratitude, I would now thank you, but I cannot. I have never desired your good opinion, and you have certainly bestowed it most unwillingly. And that is all the reply, the reply which I am to have the honor of expecting? I might perhaps wish to be informed why, with so little endeavor at civility, I am thus rejected. But it is of small importance. I might as well inquire why, with so evident a design of insulting me, you chose to tell me that you liked me against your will, your reason, and even against your character. Was not this some excuse for incivility, if I was uncivil? I very clearly explained that the objections which appealed to my reason implied entirely to your family, and in no respect to yourself. I am a part of my family, Mr. Darcy. And allow me to say that since I have had the opportunity of comparing my relations with your own, the contrast is not so marked as I had been led to suppose. But aside from all questions of either feeling or family, do you think any consideration would tempt me to accept the man who has been the means of ruining, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister and involving her in misery of the acutest kind? Can you deny that you've done this? I have no wish of denying that I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister. I did not indeed anticipate that I should involve either of them in misery of any kind. On your sister's side, at least, I was never able to discover any symptoms of a peculiar regard for Mr. Bingley. While for every reason, I must rejoice in my success with my friend. Toward him I have been kinder than toward myself. Your arrogance in calmly deciding the extent of other people's sentiments does not surprise me. It is of a piece with your whole nature, but your interference in my sister's concerns is not all. Long before it had taken place, my opinion of you was decided. Your character was unfolded in the recital which I received months ago from Mr. Wickham. What can you have to say on this subject? In what imaginary act of friendship can you here defend yourself? You take an eager interest in that gentleman. Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feeling an interest in him. His misfortunes! Yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. And of your affliction! You have reduced him to his present state of poverty, comparative poverty. You have withheld the advantages which you must know to have been designed for him. You have done all this, and yet you can treat the mention of his misfortunes with contempt and ridicule. And this is your opinion of me? This is the estimation in which you hold me? I thank you for explaining it so fully. Perhaps if I were to divulge the truth regarding Mr. Wickham, I might give you as great a surprise as you have given me. I do not care to go into particulars, but in justice to myself, I must tell you that the man whom you consider a martyr is a profligate with the most vicious propensities. A man who should never have entered your home, for his presence there is a constant source of danger. Mr. Darcy. I am ready to give you the full proofs of all I have, I have said, Miss Bennet, whenever you may so desire. Although I would gladly forget all the miserable circumstances myself, and no obligation less than the present should induce me to unfold them to any human being. Your judgment in the matter of my sister's happiness has given me a gauge by which I can measure your fairness to a man who has been so unfortunate as to offend you. My faith in Mr. Wickham is unshaken. I shall take what you have said, Miss Bennet, as a reflection on my judgment alone. Otherwise, my veracity would be at stake, and this, I am sure, you did not intend. Indeed, I understand your whole position perfectly. I have erred in the manner of my declaration. Your bitter accusations might have been suppressed had I concealed my struggles. It is my own fault. I have wounded your pride. I should have flattered you into the belief that I was impelled by inclination, by reason, by reflection, by everything. But disguise of every sort is my abhorrence. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? 
And do you expect me to rejoice in your proposal that I ally myself to the conceit and impertinence of yours? No, Mr. Darcy. The manner of your declaration has affected me in only one way. It has spared me the concern which I might otherwise have felt in refusing you had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike way. You could not, however, have made me the offer of your hand in any possible way that would have tempted me to accept it. I had not known you a month before I felt that you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. You have said quite enough, madam. I perfectly comprehend your feelings and have now only to be ashamed of what my own have been. Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time. And accept my best wishes for your health and happiness. Dearest Lizzie, I have bad news for you, and it cannot be delayed. An express came to us last night from Colonel Forster. He told us that Lydia had run away from Brighton with one of his officers to own the truth with Wickham. He first thought they had gone to Scotland, but, oh, Lizzie, it is far worse than that. We now know that Wickham never intended to go there or to marry Lydia at all. Colonel Forster has been here today. He says Wickham is not a man to be trusted. He has left Brighton terribly in debt, and his record is bad in every way. Oh, Lizzie, our distress is very great. My father is going to London and Colonel Forrester instantly to try to discover the fugitives. It is hard to ask you to shorten your visit, but we are in such distress that... Miss Bennet? Good God, what is the matter? Shall I call the maid, Miss Bennet? A glass of wine? Shall I get it for you? You were very ill. No, I thank you. There is nothing the matter with me. I am quite well. I am only distressed by some dreadful news which I have just received from Longbourn. I am sorry, very indeed. I have just had a letter from Jane with such dreadful news. It cannot be concealed from anyone. I am grieved, Miss Bennet. Grieved indeed. Mr. Darcy, you were right. If I had only believed you, you and others, but I could not believe it. What is it, my dear Miss Bennet? What has happened? Oh, I, I cannot tell it, and, and yet everyone must know. Lydia has, has eloped, has thrown herself into the power of, of Mr. Wickham. She has no money, nothing that can tempt him to... She is lost forever. Good God, Miss Bennet. Your sister and Wickham? Well, this is my fault. I should have realized this danger. I should have spoken. My own wretched experience with this man should have been told. Your experience? Yes, I... You remember? I hinted it to you. Today... But I should long ago have spoken boldly. What do you mean? Mr. Wickham attempted the same plan with my own sister two years ago. She was an ignorant, innocent, trusting girl of 15. Happily, his villainy was discovered and prevented. But oh, I should have told you had his character been known, this could not have happened. You tried to tell me, Mr. Darcy. Everybody has tried to warn me, but I could not believe it. And now... It's too late. It's too late. Let us hope not. Is what you have told me certain? Absolutely certain. Oh, yes. They left Brighton together on Sunday night. They are certainly not gone to Scotland. And what has been done, or attempted, to recover your sister? My father has gone to London. He will beg my Uncle Gardner's assistance, but nothing can be done. I know very well that nothing can be done. How is such a man to be worked on? How are they ever to be discovered? I have not the smallest hope. It is horrible. Miss Bennet, I have made a wretched mistake in all this. Would to heaven that anything could be said or done on my part that might make you reparation or offer consolation to such distress. Mr. and Mrs. Collins are returning. What would you wish me to do? I do not know. I do not know.
You really wish to return home at once? Oh, yes. Yes, at once. Take me home, Mr. Darcy. Take me home. Mr. Bennet goes after Lydia and the wretched Mr. Wickham, while Jane and Elizabeth are left to fret at home. Finally, they receive word that Lydia and Wickham have, in fact, married. Mr. Bennet reveals that Mr. Wickham only agreed to marry Lydia when he was guaranteed ten thousand pounds, but no one is clear on who made the offer. The mystery is quickly solved when Lady de Bourgh turns up at the Bennets and insists, rather rudely, that Elizabeth admits she has entered into a secret engagement with Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth refuses to admit any such thing. The lady departs. Miss Bennet, believe me, I should not have followed my friend. I only expected to ride with him to the lodge, but... But I met my aunt coming away from here, and from something she said, I feared, I imagined she might have offended, distressed you. Forgive my intrusion. I will go. No. Stay, Mr. Darcy. Excuse my own incivility. Your aunt's visit has excited me. I shall be myself in a moment. Mr. Darcy... Your aunt has told me of our overwhelming obligation to you. You must let me thank you for your unexampled kindness to my poor sister. Damn! Oh, I beg your pardon, Miss Bennet. I, I beg your pardon. What right has my aunt to meddle in my affairs? How dare she give you such distress? It is far better that we know the truth, Mr. Darcy. For my part, I can never express to you our obligation. Oh, Miss Bennet, I beg of you. The obligation was entirely my own. I only did what was my decent, plain duty. You remember, I told you, if I had spoken, this would never have happened. Yes, I remember. But you exaggerated your responsibility. I, we, of course, my father will see your aunt about your loan to us. I would not have Lady Catherine think that- Oh, I will settle matters with Lady Catherine. Have no fears on that score, Miss Bennet. She shall be said right, I assure you. Thank you. And for all your trouble, your kindness. My family can never repay you. Your family owes me nothing. If I had any thought beyond my duty, it was a thought of... you. Oh, pardon me. Perhaps I ought not to say all this. But I owe you a great deal, Miss Bennet. More than you can know, and I want you to understand me better. I really am not the pretentious prig I must have seemed to you. I wish you could forgive my abominable pride. I will, on one condition. Name it. That you forget my unwarrantable prejudice. Oh, Miss Bennet! I really think, after all, I shall have to be grateful to my aunt. She has done us an enormous service. <laughs> well... Lady Catherine loves to be useful. My selfish conceit has wounded you past help. Every sentiment of your nature has felt it. Seen it. But one sentiment they say is blind. Miss Bennet! Dearest, loveliest Elizabeth! <laughs> 